Let me start with my generation, with the, the grandparents out there. You are our living link to the past. Tell your grandchildren the story of struggles waged at home and abroad, of sacrifices freely made for freedom's sake, and tell them your own story as well, because every American has a story to tell. Long before we thought about colleges, careers, or places to live and visit, our parents, grandparents, families had their own hopes and ambitions, dreams and personal experiences. Many of these lives were interrupted when they were called to serve in the United States military. They have stories to tell about their time and service to our nation. The Library of Congress Veterans History Project, part of the American Folklife Center, collects these veteran stories. So that future generations may hear directly from them in an effort to better understand the realities of war and life in the armed services. The program is conducted through congressional offices and relies on a network of veteran service organizations. Universities, secondary schools, community groups, and the general public to record interviews according to program guidelines. The project seeks oral histories that tell more than just the dates and places of service. Along with the video interviews, the project accepts original letters, diaries, and photographs. In September of 2018, students in the English 11 class at Hillcrest High School in Strawberry, Arkansas, were invited to participate in the Veterans History Project. For several months in that English class, students were not only granted the privilege of meeting outstanding individuals who had served in the United States military, but they also learned about the awesome power of personal storytelling. On Veterans Day of 2018, they began to interview veterans from all walks of life and military experience. For the junior class at Hillcrest High School, participating in the Veterans History Project was not only a classroom assignment. It was about touching their futures by connecting with their pasts. This documentary film is dedicated to those veterans who shared their stories. It is for them and their families and a grateful nation. And a grateful nation. And a grateful nation. Uh, a veteran to me is, I think, of basically is a hero, because uh, without them doing what they do, going on there and surviving and coming back, we wouldn't be a great nation. We are today, and I wouldn't be sitting in this chair answering this question. While you were over there, did you did you think about anything um, happening back home or anything like that? Oh yeah, that's something you think about all the time. And uh, you always think about your family, your home, and what would you be doing if you was home? In fact, I was on the boat going across the water for fourteen days on the ship going across the Pacific Ocean on Mother's Day, and that didn't set good. You know, you want to be home, and all the days we sat there. And one of the boys I was with there, he got a picture from me. His mother and dad sent him a picture of his a cotton patch. You know, and their milk cow. <laughs> they made him so homesick, he just bunted it up and sent it back home. He didn't want to keep it. <laughs> That's just about the way we all felt. We all wanted to be home. We didn't want to be sitting there. No one, <clears throat> we never knew what we were shooting at. When they called in a fire mission, and we had so many rounds we had to shoot. <clears throat> we had no idea of where it was going. The gun would range seven miles. But of course, it didn't. We wouldn't depend on the elevation on where it where it landed at. And, but that way, 
we didn't know it, never knew, never knew what we were shooting at, or whether we did anybody or not. And I hope we didn't. I hope we never killed a soul. But that's something we don't know. How were you received by your family and community? That one is a great one uh, because I saw so many Vietnam veterans that you know, knew several that didn't, was a war that wasn't supported. Uh, even the people that didn't like the fact that we were there supported the troops. How did your wartime experience affect your life? Mm. There's a lot of things you see that you wish you could unsee. Uh, you know, there was, you know, especially, I think Afghanistan was probably one of the hardest because when we were in Iraq, most of the, there was a lot of, I say, a lot of that was people getting blown up in IEDs and stuff, in vehicles and stuff. Uh, there was a lot of trauma, a lot of blood, a lot of gore you know, on a daily basis. Afghanistan would, didn't have as many roads and stuff. Most of the guys were going out on foot patrols. And when they got blew up, it was a whole lot more, you know. You saw amputations where the guys came in with both legs blown off every couple of days. I mean, that was just, seeing some of that was tough. Uh, you wish you could kind of unsee it, but. Uh, How did you readjust to civilian life? I still don't think I have. <laughs> uh, and meaning on that, a lot of people, when we come back, they said that we changed a lot and they were wrong. They've changed. When we went as kids to Vietnam and we came back, we were still the same. Here in the United States, we kept hearing of uh, like Martin Luther King being killed. Um, bunch of uh, racial things that was going out in the West Coast and just a variety of different things uh, that was going on that you really had a hard time adjusting back to the United States because what you had when you left, it wasn't there no more. So you pretty much, a lot of us, we left home and haven't been back since. Where were you when the war ended? Uh, I was in Vietnam when uh, I was discharged. Of course, the war didn't end for several years later. But, uh, were you received by your family and community? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you feel like war is a good thing or a bad thing? Do I think what? Do you feel like war is a good thing or a bad thing? War is basically a bad thing. But it serves a higher purpose. Uh, uh, it's like correcting your children. You know, you hate to have to do it, uh, but it has to be done. And, and uh, war is the same way. Without war, there's no telling what kind of situation we would all be living in right now. The most significant part of the interview for me was when my grandfather shared a moment from war where he almost lost his life and it was the night before they returned home and he had already turned in all of his weapons and all he had was his orders and they were being shot at and he just remembered laying in the floor and holding on to his orders and praying that he made it out alive. And that is the most significant part to me because I would not be sitting here today telling you about it. Getting in combat, a lot of people want to know, did you kill anybody? Did you kill anybody? Said, Hell, I don't know. I didn't go out there and kick him and see if he's alive. And there's so many shooting, you don't know if your bullet hit anybody or not, you know. How was the social life over there? 
social life. There mm-hmm. wasn't any social life over there. We worked seven days a week. A lot of times on Sunday, that'd be a slack day. I'd get bored, and I'd volunteer to ride machine gun for the captain. He'd want to go out and look at the job to see what was going on. And I, I did that several times. And my old buddy, Frank Pelushi, he was the Jeep driver for the captain. And me and him were real good friends anyway. Every time I got a chance to ride a shotgun or be a machine gunner, I, I jumped on that opportunity. And uh, I blew a bridge up one night. Well, they, they tried to blow them up every night. We'd build them and they'd blow them up. So they just need my communication. So they sent me and uh, this guy from Delaware, Campbell was his last name. <clears throat> he was a radio man. And I went out there. I volunteered to ride the shotgun with him and take, take care of him, help fight if I had to. We got pretty comfortable, and I got to pull my I pull my helmet off, my flight jacket, and I got feeling real comfortable. Lit me up a cigarette and walking around. Next thing I knew, I was rounds coming in on us. You could hear them. You could see them hitting the ground. I don't know where they was at, but he got on the radio, hollered back at the company, at the office and told him we was taking on uh, fire. We was under fire at the time. And if he wanted us to return fire or throw some hand grenades at him or, or what, and they, they wouldn't let us. They said, no, nah, yeah, yeah, just you two. You're probably going to need some help if you do anything. He said, get in your Jeep and get back to the company. So they didn't have to twist our arms. We, we, we talk off back to the company. That's a pretty close call right there. You hear a lot of groups today talking that uh, we don't need a military. We do need military. And you hear a lot of young kids and stuff protesting today in the military. You know, ah, we, you know, there's a lot of stuff on TV today that's not really right. I'm not saying it's lies. I'm not saying it's fiction. But there's... I can tell you my thoughts and I can bend it around to where you'll think that, by golly, he's right. You know? but, and, and a lot of people are easy to influence today. And they don't have the facts, and, and that's got to change. I mean, they got to wake up and see what's going on instead of just saying, well, Joe Blow here said we don't need the military. It's all a bunch of bull. Now, just because Joe Blow says that, don't mean it. You know, get your facts. Uh, and that's why I still maintain today that the military is good for people. Uh, it'll grow you up. It'll learn you. It'll teach you. Uh, you'll learn respect. You'll learn how to work with people. And it's just something good for the country. It's good for you. And any, any man that goes in will come out a better man. Any female that goes in will come out a better woman. Uh, and like I said, I've got a, I got a grandson. He's wanting to go. I go for it. My wife said, yeah, but, you know, no, it'd be good for him. You'll be fine. So, you know, it's, it's just, it instills pride in you. And, and that's, that's a lot of what's happening today in this country. The, the pride is going away. Do you feel the pressure or stress? Sometimes, yes. Yeah, I get, I got PTSD, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, was there something special that you did for good luck down here? Uh, oh, not really. Just watch your back, you know. Just watch your back. And your surroundings, you know. Much you care. Like I say, I got wounded three times, but you know. What did you do on when on leave? When I was in Vietnam, I just had one leave. You know, and we, I met my wife. And, you 
me and my wife in Hawaii for a but <clears throat> we had to go back. We had to go back to her, you know, go to Canada or burn a draft card. And you know. You know, this is the United States of America. You know. Not, I got out of Vietnam, come home, and uh, it was about 15 or 16 years after I got back, I decided to decided to go back in, make a career out of it. As I've seen, I've seen a lot of places, you know. Nothing like the scripture. Veterans to me mean people who were heroes who sacrificed themselves and pieces of themselves to help and serve others. They are heroes and very strong people. Um, I'm very, very grateful for them because if it wasn't for them being strong enough and brave enough to go and fight for us, um, we wouldn't have the ability to be free like we are today and be able to do the things we're able to do. So I'm very Veterans grateful. Veterans self-sacrifice. Because they sacrifice everything they have, go out of their daily lives, go into so, to a zone, a state of mind that no one else in civilian life should have to go through. They sacrifice not only their heart, their soul, their mind, their body, but everything they come to know and love. The reason I picked the, the Navy is because I got a postcard in the mail from a Navy recruit out of Base Florida, uh, Base Florida Arkansas that said, if you want to do the job you want to do, call this number, the 1-800 number. I called it, the next day, a Navy recruiter showed up. And that started, the, that was the beginning of an illustrious 26-year, 18-day career. <laughs> Salute. <laughs> Where exactly did you go during your service? All over the world. Never was out of the state of Arkansas until I joined the Navy. I've been everywhere, pretty much everywhere. Do you recall any particular humorous or unusual events? Humorous, and, yeah. And what were some of the pranks that you and others would pull? The most humorous was with Chief Gary Atkinson. He was my mentor. My sea daddy, they called him back in the day. When you were young, which I used to be, believe it or not, 18 and 19 years old, uh, the, the chief of your division, you know, he takes you under his, under his wing and he uh, tries to teach you right and wrong in the Navy way. You know, there's the right way, the wrong way, and the Navy way. That's what he's. That's what his teachings was. And uh, we had to, we had a CHT line. That's a that's a sewage line, a sanitation line, to get clogged up. <laughs> so he told us to go down there and unclog it. So we went down there to unclog it. Me and two other guys, and uh, we couldn't get it to unclog. So I went, I went back up and got him, and he come down there, and he pulled the plug off the end of the clean out, and he said, "Now go up." One deck to the clean out up there and take a CO2 bottle and fill that line full of CO2 pressure. A lot of pressure on that in that bottle. And we did. And while we were doing that, he still had that cap off the end of that line. And he's sitting there looking up in that pipe with a flashlight. <laughs> well, that stuff broke loose. <laughs> and where did it go? Right in his face. <laughs> I died laughing. <laughs> he had crap hanging all in his beard because you got to have a beard back then. Yeah, he had nasty stuff hanging all over him. He was pretty mad, but he was laughing too. Now let me tell you something, John. I've been all over this world, okay? I've been throughout Europe. I've been to South America. I've been in the Asian countries. You know, I've been in Singapore. I've been in India. I've been, I mean, there is no place better than the United States of America. And don't let anybody tell you different, okay? 
There's no place better than where we live here. So what message would you like to leave for future generations who will view slash hear this interview? What message would I like to leave? Yeah. Um, um, well, I guess I could say bluntly, and I don't mean to be disrespectful to anybody, but bluntly I would say love it or leave it. You know, take care of it. Honor your country. You know, and if you're thinking about serving, you know, in the U.S. military, I would highly recommend that you do that. You know, highly recommend. Like I said earlier, I think every man and woman should do a stint in the military. Um, I think they owe it to this country for the freedoms they have. And they, wouldn't, they don't realize, like I just said a minute ago, what they have until they see what other countries don't have that we have. And uh, that would be my message. Love it or leave it. And if you love it, take care of it and serve it. It was a different, uh, different time as far as how veterans were treated, though, because with the Vietnam War, you didn't, veterans weren't respected as much as they are now. Uh, in fact, you know, Arkansas has always been strong behind the veterans, but uh, California sure wasn't. Uh, you know, I, I was glad to. I went from Oakland over to San Francisco airport, got on a plane, came home. And did you serve on the front line? Everywhere was a front line in Vietnam. It was a different war. There weren't places you can say this is, you know, this is safe and this is not safe. I mean, I'm not going to say that every day you were in danger of losing your life. No, the infantry guys were. But uh, there were places there that was relatively safe and places, obviously, that weren't. But nowhere was completely safe. When I came into the country, we came in to the country at Cameron Bay, Vietnam. And from there, we, the troops were sent to different places to be assigned to companies. Uh, and the very first night... I was there, we had incoming mortar rounds. So, you know, there you think this is safe, you know, big, big military installation. And the very first night, you had in, incoming rounds. So nowhere was completely safe. It's a feeling you never get over to this day. When a flag's presented or the national anthem's played, you still want to come to attention and draw up a salute. And... It makes you very proud to have been a part of that, especially the older you get, when you really do realize how many of these people have given up their lives so we can have what we have today. Tell me about your boot camp or training experiences. Yes, I do have one. I never will forget. Why did I forget that? We were out on the parade grounds one day, standing at... Um, Parade rest, which the only thing between that and attention is your hands are behind your back. And I felt something on a leg, and I looked down real quick, and it was an ant crawling up my leg. So I took my other foot and kicked it off, and got caught. I moved in line. So she had me go to the edge of the grass and find me an ant. And I had to draw up a salute and report it to that ant 50 times. So there I am out in the grass on my knees hitting these ants till I get my 50 times done. My general one day said, uh, uh, your scouts, I was then the intelligence officer for the 17th Cavalry Squadron. He said, your scouts have told me they have found this bunker out on Hamburger Hill in the Oshaw Valley that they want... Um, that uh, they don't know what it is, but it's got a lot of wires going into it. And uh, so he said, I need pictures of that. You know, this is way out in bad guy territory. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. And so I did. And the cab got me a little OH-2 helicopter, the little bubble helicopter. And uh, me and the pilot, we went out there. Of course, we had cobras and, and uh, 
vacuities all around us to protect us while we're out there. But the stipulation was we couldn't shoot back. We didn't want the North Vietnamese to know that we knew where that thing was, whatever it was, and we couldn't shoot up the place because we thought it was North Korean intelligence gathering apparatus, which it turned out to be. Um, so we got out there and, and we had to circle around this mountain uh, and take pictures of that thing. And there was one man guarding it. He looked old. Uh, he had a bolt action rifle. And he must have had similar orders because we flew around it two or three times before he shot at us. But finally he shot at us a time or two and I took my pictures and left. And then when I got back to, to uh, base camp, Camp Eagle, briefed the general and told him I thought it was a, a direction finding antenna that the North Vietnamese had built into the top of that mountain so they could uh, pinpoint by which way the signal comes in our various units that were out in that region, special forces units and long range reconnaissance patrols and aircraft that get shot down and things like that. And that's what it turned out to be. But uh, general looks up to me and he He's, uh, as we're briefing him, he said, Clark, Clark, they briefed me that if you go out and get yourself shot down, I'm to do everything possible to get you out. And I said, we normally carried a one Huey with six infantrymen in the back, we call them grunts, to pick up pilots when they got shot down in the, in the choppers. It would happen every day. And... Uh, he said, I'll have to put in a, a, a team of blues to get you out. That'd be two helicopters coming out to uh, get me off the ground and back in the safety. And I said, sir, I'm hoping you put in the whole company if I get shot down out there. The veteran that I interviewed had very many stories to tell, but none stood out more than one of a fallen soldier. He received a letter not too long ago about a family that was looking for said fallen soldier. And he contacted the organization that he was affiliated with and asked them to let the family know that he did not make it and that he was deceased. But he shared this story with me of what happened to the soldier. And the fact that he could keep that to himself and not be able to tell anybody is truly something that is phenomenal. Yeah, and we took them back, and it uh, wasn't long till I got a letter next month, I guess, when we went back, and it was nominated for the Bronze Star for Captured 17. <laughs> <laughs> 17 prisoners. So it's still on the record. I told them, I said, no, they give up. Yeah. They didn't keep it that way. I'm sure you wasn't complaining. No, no. Uh -uh. Uh, you said you had two bronze stars? Yeah. Uh, what was your other one for? Well, it was, uh, we was in a, it was at night time, we was in a pretty bad uh, uh, fight. And uh, we had a medic, and he, he was so, I wish doctors were dedicated as he was, but somebody, we were hollering after the main battle was over when that snow going on up in the woods there above us. And he took off. And it was just them. They knew what they had this hollering medic, medic. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got hurt. They kept, like to kill him. And then I went up there and got him, pulled him back. Wasn't very far, probably 50, 100 yards, something like that. And they gave me a bronze star for that. I took that because I was scared. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But anyhow, that's the other one. My brother got three over there. Yep, three brown stars. Said you were also awarded a Purple Heart? Yes, sir. May I ask what that's for? You bet. His hand come through here. We was on patrol at night. We, we'd patrol through the, across the fir, uh, 30, 38th parallel because we was, there was a, that's a, the later part of the war. That's 1951. And they started peace talks. But we still 
patrol way back in there. And I had a squad and the, another guy from South Carolina, he had a squad and we was, we, I guess we thought that the war was about over because there's peace talks going mm-hmm. on. Well, we run right into a Chinese patrol and they started shooting at us. And I had my, had my rifle there and I had it like that. It come, the bullet come through here in the end of my chest and then in this hand. And I was very lucky, but it knocked me out. And uh, when I woke up, I didn't have no pants on. Somebody needed, they come up and checked us. They thought I was dead because there's a lot of blood. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and it took my pants. What I hate about it, I had $1,400 GI script in my pocket. They took it. I don't know what to do with throw it away. It wasn't no good to them. But they gave us GI script. They didn't give us money. But when we got back, you cashed in for American money. But I had 14. I'd been a saving all that time. I just, I was, I was past rotation time. I was supposed to have already been gone. But I, as an old sergeant, Terry, he was a World War II sergeant. And he, uh, his health got, got bad. He couldn't hardly do keep up, and, and I let him have my rotation. I stayed two more months, but I got hurt in the meantime. But wasn't too bad. Did anything humorous or unusual happen while you were overseas? Yeah, there's a few. Um, one story I'll, I'll share. Uh, a friend of a really good friend of mine, Sergeant Brett White. We were in Baghdad just on the northwest corner of Baghdad, and there was a particular place in the city that that we would go uh, on a fairly fairly regular basis, and we it started uh, started to become um, commonplace for us to get attacked in this area with IEDs. So there was insurgents that were coming in, and they were sitting IEDs, and, and uh, it, it, they had taken out a couple of our trucks and, and wounded a couple of guys. So Sergeant White and his fire team, so a five-man team, were chosen to uh, go into a, like a, I guess a makeshift sniper mission. And they were going to pull Overwatch off a of rooftop that was that could oversee the area that we'd been getting hit in. And we had went in and dropped them off a few blocks away, I'm out of the trucks, and they were going to, uh, they were going to negotiate uh, the alleyways and and go behind the, the houses and buildings until they got to the rooftop that they that they wanted to to get in. And along the way, um, they had uh, come across a sewage ditch. They didn't know it was a sewage ditch at the time. They thought it was just a, a small depression in the ground. The thing you have to know about Iraq is um, it's not like it is here in the States. There's, there's open sewage ditches everywhere. The they don't have the the elaborate uh, pipes and everything that we have here that, that remove all the sewage. So when they were running across this uh, vacant lot between two buildings with their night vision on, all they could see with the night vision was a, a dark spot on the ground that they thought was just a, a small depression. And Sergeant White was the first man across because he was he was the leader of that fire team. And when he took off running, he ended up being a, a little more than waist deep in uh, nothing but, but raw sewage. And uh, it, it took a few minutes for his guys to get him pulled out, not because he was that stuck, but because they were laughing so hard that they couldn't hardly uh, uh, get him pulled out of the ditch. Let's say that um, he no longer has those boots or pants, and he didn't have after that night because they were solid black and they would never come clean again. And they actually made him uh, strip down and, and wash off with water bottles before they even let him back in the truck when they got picked up uh, a few minutes later. So it was a, uh, it was very comical that night and it, it could have, it could have gone a lot worse, I guess. But, uh, but that was, uh, there, there are many other stories, but that's, that's one that, that's, that always stick out in my mind few times we have run into another patrol and it got kind of bad and we tried actually tried to when they were at a distance when we'd see another patrol at a distance 
we can actually lock and load and turn our, our weapons the other direction and watch them and we just keep going and let them fire first if they wanted to but most times they didn't want to <coughs> do any more than we did so we just passed each other in the jungle and but our unit had two people to die and one one patrol and we were ambushed and our trucks going they, they hauled the boys out to the outpost and trucks and they ambushed them one time, killed everybody. I think there was, uh, in the tail truck, I think there was five or six guys there and they killed them all. Took their name tags and a rank insignia and disappeared, took off. That was some really bad, serious, sad times. So have you learned any life lessons from serving? Oh, many, many, but I, where, where would I start to say one is, uh, I think it goes back to, uh, you know, you realize after being a servant in Vietnam that how precious life is. And that, uh, you know, here you and I right now are communicating and we're looking at each other eyeball to eyeball and uh, we're, we're talking. And then, uh, you know, in a split second, you know, you can just be a mass of uh, flesh that doesn't function anymore. So it gives you a lot better, from the Vietnam side of the house, gave you a little bit better, a whole lot better perspective on what what life is about. And, uh, and so it, uh, you just learn to, uh, uh, you know, you appreciate your family and your friends and your children, grandchildren, a lot better. Did serving impact your feelings on the military or war? Well, unfortunately, you know, there's, if it's war on terrorism or, or whatever, uh, you know, veterans or, or soldiers before they become veterans, you know, they didn't, they're not politically motivated one way or the other. They were just told that once you take that oath of enlistment, you know, you're, you belong to the service at that time. And you go where they want you to go. And uh, so you try to keep your feelings out of it. You personally know that, hey, is this a good good thing or it's not a good thing. And uh, but again, you don't get to look at the big picture all the way down. You're there to serve. And uh, so we just hope that the decision makers, the leadership and the government that we have, the president of the United States and then his commanders under him, that they will uh, they are making the right choice. Uh, can you tell me about a couple of your most memorable experiences? Oh, I don't know if that's... Is this going to be censored? Um, I remember the awe, the wonder, when we went to a uh, weapons training battalion. We do uh, an exercise called a final protective fire, where every weapon in the entire company is firing at a position. Tracers, mortars... Automatic weapons, it's it's a sight to behold at night. It was better than any fireworks you'll ever see. Um, I remember landing when we went to Operation Desert Shield. I remember landing at uh, in, in uh, Saudi Arabia and coming to the realization that, you know, hey, I may not ever come home from this. Um, but probably my most memorable I spent my first two years of active duty on an aircraft carrier, basically living the, the movie Top Gun, if anybody out there has ever seen that movie. Um, first time I ever walked up on the flight deck of the carrier, we were going out across the North Atlantic, headed for the Mediterranean for six months. And you walk out up on the top of this boat that's almost 1,100 feet long, 6,000 plus men on the boat, and you look around, you can see nothing but water. Kind of freaks you out, but it was gorgeous. Uh, first, first place I got in Vietnam uh, was uh, uh, Donzhen, but I was all over that country pretty much. Been truck driver. I saw truck driver was your job in there. Yeah, that uh, guarding the base, asphalt bunker was a buzzer. 
on his way out in the middle of nothing. He got hit there. About the only thing I knew to do had been foot bad enough to run over. So there's a big old bank up there, probably 40 foot high with his own. And I probably jumped off out in a damn tree or something there and tried to hang on to a bush or something I could get to the ground. But I never got that rough. Uh, we got hit some. What was some of your medals that you won? Well, I got all three of the Vietnam medals and I got a presidential citation for outstanding duty in a <clears throat> war zone. Do you ever wish you didn't serve? Yeah. Yeah. The way they treated us when we got back over here, but even the people didn't like us, you know. We had fucked up much people, you know. Uh, somebody wants around, they didn't want you in the bar, they didn't want you, you know, nowhere. That was pretty much, uh, we were treated like crap. How has your military service impacted your feelings about war in the military in general? Well, it really hasn't impact, impacted it very much. I mean, I'm more knowledgeable than most about it from being in the military, from serving. I try to educate people whenever they say, oh, this is what they're doing this for, and it's bad. No, there's a bigger meaning behind it. I mean, everything has a bigger meaning. So you can't just look and say, oh, well, we're just going to some other country to take care of their business. And you know, if you think about it in retrospect, in the big picture, it will become our business later on down the line. So why not stop it before it becomes our business, before it's bad? What message would you like to leave for future generations who will view or hear this interview? Well, uh, I'd just like to say the, the, the military is really, I believe, the backbone of the, of the U.S. economy and everything else. We stop people from uh, coming in, taking over, and we help other countries too. It's not, it's not just war. I mean, we're aid for other countries as well, and a lot of other countries need the help, and they, they have to have the help and everything else. But... Uh, yeah, I mean, I'd say look look deeper into it than just the surface because there's more beyond it. And war just scratches the surface of it, and that that's what people that's what people think of whenever they think of the military war. Well, it's not all about war. Were there any casualties in your unit? Uh, we did have a couple of casualties. Um, we had uh, a staff sergeant that was actually my first rating official whenever I got there. And uh, she actually got hit uh, over in Fallujah in a road sub bombing. Uh, I'd not been at base very long. She was actually still my rating official whenever, whenever it happened. She was just, uh, I'd been temporarily reassigned while she was in deployment. Uh, and other than her, my direct unit didn't have any any casualties from wartime activity. I would have actually served during the uh, Vietnam era. Never went to Vietnam. I was during the, most of the Vietnam War. I was in the uh, Alaska, and that was considered a front line to the Cold War between the United States and Russia at that time. We had a lot of interaction with them. <laughs> Uh, you know, an example, they would make runs at us with their bombers and things like that, and we'd do what we were supposed to do, run out and put the missiles up and get ready and wait on them, and generally they had a certain line where they would turn back, and when they did, we'd stand down, and if they went to a different line, then we did something else to the missiles, and then we got to a different line, all these are points in space, really, miles close to us, then the Air Force would get involved and once you hit another line it was you either received permission to fire or not, you know. Mm -hmm. 
what what's one of your best stories you've had you have from the what do you mean being in the stories in uh, the Cold War? Unusual things. Mm-hmm. I think the most unusual thing was at one time the uh, Russians were particularly making a run at us, and they hit a line that you know we did this, and then they hit a line that we did that, and I'm on top of a mountain. It's just leveled off, mm-hmm. so I could go to the fence and look down, and. Uh, they hit the last line, and that's when you you got your missiles up and turned on, and you, all you have to do is just go in and fire them. And something I'll never forget, I looked down at the uh, base and seen when my little girl was going to grade school, and then go do what you got to do. Absolutely. If I got a call today and said, would you be willing to go on active duty? You bet I would. Go in a heartbeat. I would do it again if they called me. I don't regret it one bit. Yeah, I don't care what you're taught in school or at home. Don't ever think bad about the military. They're not politicians and they're there just to to keep this country free and I hope we're not going to ever lose what we've got. I didn't I did a little small part, but you know, I hope I hope my small part contributed to some, you know, somebody coming home that might not have. That if they have to go to defend their country, do the best they can. And when they come back, be proud of what they've done. We were proud of what we did, but nobody back then uh, cared at the time. We were called uh, so many names that still affect us today that we try to push off to the side, and I hope that in the future that the military people are able to leave everything at war and not bring it home. But you can't, you will bring it home, but just stay with it and survive through it. There is no way to maintain the frontiers of freedom without cost and commitment and risk. There is no swift and easy path to peace in our generation. No man who witnessed the tragedies of the last war, no man who can imagine the unimaginable possibilities of the next war can advocate war out of irritability or frustration, or impatience. Turn 31 in Arif John and we headed up that road. A sturdy pack across my back My final letters home We drove up that MSR Those Humvees running hot Rolling across the desert sand Through the land that God forgot And I learned to love the rumble And the kick of my carbine I contemplated life for a while as I changed magazines. There's a man in bubble 
shop they're trying to replace Every night I close my eyes and I can see his face I met a man in Suboxur whose name I'll never know Him or me and I'm still here living with his ghost And I learned to love the rumble, the kick of my carbine I contemplated life for a while as I changed magazines In there and in evening shade there's graves I go to see Men who fought right by my side now they're gone from me Cause the road to Artemia is dangerous and hard There's a chance you're coming back and there's a chance you're not Those RPGs and IEDs they never got the best of me Words like that you just can't trust They took the best of all of us And I learned to love the rumble The kick of my carbine I contemplated life a while As I changed magazines I learned to love the rumble The kick of my carbine Contemplated life a while As I change magazine